Since 2015, Pop Health Podcast has brought to you some of the best minds in healthcare, including leaders from government, not-for-profit, and investor-backed powerhouses, as they share successes, failures, and how our audience can move forward in today's constantly evolving healthcare world. Thank you for joining us for today's episode presented by 24-Hour Home Care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. I'm Gavin Ward, host of Pop Health Podcast. In today's episode, I had the opportunity to sit down with the new president and chief executive officer of America's Physician Groups, Susan Denser, who replaced the now retired founding CEO, Don Crane, who had been on the show many times. Now, Susan has had a wonderful career in healthcare policy and had actually worked with America's Physician Groups, also referred to as APG, for many years. So when someone came calling and said, hey, we're looking for a new leader, would you be interested? Uh, Susan threw her name into the hat, into the ring. So Susan will share a little bit about her story there, but she'll also share about what APG has been up to in 2022 and what's happening at their upcoming conference in the spring of 2023. We hope you enjoy today's episode with Susan and America's Physician Groups. Feel free to check out other episodes of Pop Health Podcast by visiting us on our website, finding us on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks everybody. Enjoy today's episode. Hi, Susan. Thanks so much for joining the show today. Great to be with you, Gavin. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. And we appreciate the opportunity to have you on um, and have APG back on the show as well. So, uh, Susan, can you share with us how you got connected to America's Physician Groups? Absolutely, Gavin. I've been uh, in some way, shape, or form involved in health policy in particular for a number of my of years, most of my professional career. I started off my professional life in journalism. I was a, a writer and reporter for such publications as Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report. I spent 10 years as the health policy correspondent for the PBS NewsHour. I was recruited away from that to lead the health policy journal Health Affairs as editor in chief, which I did for five years. And then I went to several nonprofit and think tank type organizations, including most recently, I was a senior policy fellow at Duke University's health policy center called the Robert J. Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University, uh, working on a lot of policy issues, in particular for uh, reasons you can well imagine, the last couple of years was heavily devoted to COVID-19 and its oh, yeah. implications. Um, I was really happy at, uh, at Duke Margolis, working very closely with my colleague, Mark McClellan, who was the uh, administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Some people will recall during the George W. Bush administration. And my colleagues at Duke were just wonderful people. And I was thoroughly enjoying the policy related uh, work we were doing there. However, the phone rang one day and it was a headhunter looking for uh, someone to take uh, the role of APG CEO and president, following in the footsteps of Don Crane, the uh, founding CEO of, uh, first of all, of CAPG, California yeah. Physician Groups, and then APG, America's Physician Groups. And you've had him on the podcast in the past, so you know Don well. Don was getting ready to retire. Uh, the uh, the uh, board had formed a search committee, and uh, they called me up and asked me if I would be interested in throwing my hat in the ring. I'd uh, done a lot of work with Don and APG over the years. I'd spoken at a number of their conferences. So we'd done some virtual uh, conferences together. So I knew the organization well, and I knew in particular a lot of the board members well, uh, including some of the people who'd been around at the founding of CAPG, like, for example, Bob Margolis. Yeah. But others on the board as well. Uh, so the organization organization was well known to me and uh, the commitment that the members of APG have to living out a new, a different model of healthcare than is generally the case in this country. Uh, as we know, the pr predominant mode of paying most healthcare remains fee for service in the United States. Whereas uh, the APG members who now number about 360 different physician groups 
all essentially agree to take responsibility and accountability for the costs and quality of healthcare by virtue of various uh, value-based payment models. And that was a model I was well familiar with in my many years of health policy related work. Uh, I believed, I believe in the transition from fee for service uh, to generally a value-based care. I think that will be better and is better for patients. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, as I say, it was uh, it was not a tall order to persuade me to to throw my hat in the ring. And uh, within a few weeks, I had been appointed the successor to Don Crane as APG's uh, president CEO. That's great. Well, that's a great background. And yes, uh, Don had been on the show before, and um, we used to have uh, APG on every year, but with COVID and um, just change uh we skipped a couple of years but it's great to have you back susan and i really appreciate that background and i'm glad you had that connection with don so um you mentioned 360 physician groups or 360 ish uh, physician groups that are a part of america's physician groups or apg um what are some of the i know i know you can't name everybody but for our audience who may not be familiar with apg are there some of the um, bit maybe bigger or more common names of physician groups that folks may be familiar with that are part of your organization Sure. The 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 uh, uh, the largest, and I would say, of course, all of the physician groups that are affiliated with Kaiser Permanente are members of ours. So the Permanente Medical Group, uh, which of course is essentially the group for Northern California, the Southern California Permanente Medical Group, uh, the Northwest Permanente Group, and so on. Those are the largest of our groups. And of course, Kaiser being a fully capitated system is sort of at the uh, the pinnacle of value-based care, right? You take yeah. full accountability for patients' health when you are essentially running a, a capitated organization that provide, also provides health care for people. And then we have a number of groups uh, in California, many of the longstanding groups. Some of them have now come under the Optum Aegis. Oh, yeah. So Monarch, for example, will be well known. And of course, what was formerly Healthcare Partners, right, as now, of course, uh, an Optum uh, owned group too, heritage, et cetera, a lot of a lot of household names there. We have a number of groups that are affiliated with health systems, okay. uh, Sutter, Providence. Uh, so again, names that will be well known. Um, uh, down in the uh, uh, sort of middle part of the state, of the state, uh, Sharp Re Steely, the, the Sharp related affiliated groups uh, toward the south, toward San Diego. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So again, a big beachhead of our many groups in California, but also national groups as well. Uh, 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 Mass General Brigham physician, uh, the physician group affiliated with Mass General is a member of ours. Uh, Mount Sinai, for example. Yeah. So uh, we, and, and a number of groups around the country that have been formed in relatively recent years to go after contracts like the so-called direct contracting model, now ACO REACH. So uh, One Medical, Iora, is a member of ours, Oak Street, uh, Village MD, a number of the uh, primary care-oriented organizations that really have focused on uh, taking primary care to the level it probably should have been operating at all along in this country. Again, taking responsibility for the health of patients. Another well-known name is ChenMed, another, another member of ours. And then we have a number of practices that are assisted by uh, such entities as Agilon in transforming themselves away from smaller physician groups that are really not in a position to take on risk yeah. to those that are big enough to take on risk and can essentially take full accountability for the costs of health care of their patients. So that should give you a pretty good sense of the spread that we have in terms of the, the diversity of the membership. Yeah, very good, Susan. You covered uh, quite a quite a number of folks there, which is great. Now, most of our audience will understand um, what capitation is and risk, but not all will. So maybe in layman's terms, Susan, could you maybe just simply explain what is capitation? 
Well, the best way to understand it is in contrast to fee-for-service payment. So if I'm a, a physician operating in a fee-for-service practice, uh, patients are going to come in and see me when they're not feeling well or need to be seen for whatever reason. I'm going to uh, perform an office visit. I may perform some additional uh, evaluations, management, or procedures, and I'm going to uh, bill for those. Uh, separately. I'll bill for the office visit. I'll bill for whatever else I do for them. Um, I don't take fundamental responsibility for their care over any uh, long-term period except uh, through my sort of caring relationships with them if I have them. Otherwise, I tend to sit in my office and wait for patients to come in to see me. And when they come in to see me, I treat them responsibly. I bill for them item by item by item. And that's that. If I'm a physician who's working in a system that's capitated, essentially what I agree to do is take more or less a lump sum payment to take care of that patient for an entire year. Uh, and I've got a clear budget, which is the capitated amount that I've been paid to take care of this patient. And I've got to make sure that all the care that this patient really needs is delivered within that payment amount. And in many instances, that payment amount is going to be risk adjusted, which is to say, if the patient is unhealthy or has a number of chronic conditions or whatever, I'm going to get paid a little bit more to do that because I don't want to, uh, the, the, the powers that be do not want to create an incentive for me to stint on care. Yeah. They want to make sure that I'm paid enough to care for this patient responsibly and provide the patient truly with the care that is needed. But essentially, you know, as the provider who, who's being paid on a capitated basis, I'm on the hook to make sure that that patient's care gets dealt with within that payment amount. So I'm truly taking responsibility for the cost of that care and for the quality of that care. Because keep in mind, if I did something like stint on care in one year and the patient ended up really sick, if that patient stays with me, I'm going to get clobbered the next year. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get clobbered if that patient ends up in the hospital uh, when I agree to take responsibility for that care. So uh, capitation uh, is or taking on risk is another uh, phrase that is often used is really a way of asking providers and provider groups to take this accountability for the cost and quality of care for patients in a way that is not necessarily the case at all in fee-for-service healthcare. Yeah, really good explanation, um, Susan. I really appreciate it. And it's one I like to ask every uh, every time I have um, you or in the past, um, Don, on the show, because I think a lot of folks, lay people who aren't in healthcare may forget um, about the difference or not even be no, not even know about it. So I really appreciate that. So you've been with APG now um, about nine months, even though you had a lot of past experiences working with them. Uh, tell us a little bit about some of the highlights over the past nine months for you. Well, the biggest highlight at all of all has really been getting to know our groups and the people behind our groups. The CEOs, many of whom are on our board of directors, the uh, chief medical officers, uh, the other uh, teams affiliated with these groups, they're just great people. Uh, and as I've said to people, it's not that they don't want to make money in healthcare. I mean, everybody who's in healthcare wants to provide good healthcare and make a living at the same time. But what the, collectively what these groups want to do is do it all the right way. They want to get the right set of incentives for them to do the right thing. They don't want to be in a, in a position where they're incentivized just to do lots of things for patients because they get paid more. They don't want to be incentivized not to care about the cost and quality for the patients. If anything, they want exactly the opposite. They want to take that responsibility and accountability for the cost and quality of care. 
and uh, seeing them uh, and, and talking with them as they are doing this in the various models in which they are working, whether it's uh, uh, in Medicare Advantage for the Medicare population, whether it's in some of the innovative payment models such as uh, ACOs, particularly ACO REACH, uh, which is in effect uh, the version of direct contracting that is is going to be uh, uh, in the marketplace as of January of this year, of next year, rather, uh, as they work their way through various models, they're not only trying to perfect the process of taking full risk and accountability for patients' uh, health and for their care, but also deal with everything else that the rest of the world is dealing with. So, for example, right now, all of our groups are dealing with issues around the workforce. Oh, yeah. Can we hire enough physicians, nurses, et cetera? Uh, how much do we need to pay them? Uh, what's the impact on our overall budget? Because as we know, labor costs are usually around 60% of the cost of running any kind of a healthcare organization. If in an environment of high inflation, there are pressures on wages, as there clearly are now, in addition to all the other factors that have taken people out of the healthcare workforce in recent years, uh, that's pressure on our, our, our groups. So they're dealing with what everybody has to deal with. And in addition to that, they're attempting to create uh, and really fully live out these value-based models of care that really do in their belief. And I think we have, uh, we're developing ample proof that this is true, uh, really do have the effect of improving the care for patients and, and uh, controlling as best as possible the cost. Yeah, very good. So you mentioned ACO reach um, and you touched on it a little bit. Um, it is not something that I'm overly familiar with. And you mentioned direct contracting. Right. So um, again, many of the audience um, are physicians, but I would say most may not be. So direct contracting, um, how do you simplify the explanation for direct contracting? Well, I, of course, just talked about capitation. And uh, a lot of people are familiar with the notion that uh, Medicare Advantage, for example, which is essentially Medicare benefits channeled through private health plans, more or less operates on a system that is very similar to capitation. Uh, a health plan that is operating a Medicare Advantage plan, if, if uh, people decide to sign up with that plan, that plan gets, in effect, what is a capitated amount to take care of that patient for the entire year. Uh, that payment is also risk adjusted. So there isn't incentive not to cover people who are sick or have multiple conditions. Uh, that the, that health plan will then turn around and essentially pay providers to provide the care for people, just the same way a health plan typically operates with respect to the provider community. So you can see there's a kind of a form of capitation, but in this case, it goes to health plans in Medicare Advantage. Um, for many years, uh, people said, well, why do we necessarily have to just have health plans uh, be the conduit for ah. that capitated payment in okay. Medicare? How about if we gave that those capitated sums directly to a provider group, a physician group, et cetera. Uh, and that idea took hold. Uh, it was christened direct contracting. And really what that means is the Medicare program is directly contracting with an entity that represents clinicians uh, to essentially do this same, take this same approach. Here's a, here's a capitated payment. Here's a per, per patient per month payment that is risk adjusted that you get and you use those funds to take care of the person in the way that is needed to keep that patient as healthy as possible out of the hospital as much as possible, have the chronic care conditions managed. And frankly, these entities also have the leeway to take some of that money and use it for things like health-related social needs. So if I yeah. am taking care of you and you're a, a Medicare patient and I recognize that you are having trouble getting your medical appointments these days, 
but I'm supposed to be taking care of you, I'm going to want to make darn sure that you're getting to your medical appointments. And I'm allowed under this kind of an arrangement to use some of the funds to pay for your transportation to come in to see me as a provider, because otherwise you're not going to come in. Uh, your conditions could get worse. I'm on the hook for that happening. So, But I can proactively uh, undertake measures like this to help you stay healthy by addressing some of these health-related social needs that you have. So that model, which was brought out like several years ago, the first performance year, as they say, of the model was 2021. Um, 53 different so-called direct contracting entities were accepted into the program. And CMS has just recently published the results from the first performance year of these 53 direct contracting entities. The results were pretty impressive. Uh, most people who have followed value-based care know that the savings for many of these uh, innovative alternative payment models have been meaningful, but small, certainly small relative to the total size of the Medicare program. Uh, in this case, the those 53 entities saved on net about $70 million for the Medicare program for taxpayers as over and against what it would have cost to keep all of the patients that they treated in the traditional Medicare program. So there was net savings of about $70 million across these 53 DCEs, as they're called. Okay. In, in particular, that was net of the fact that many of those organizations were able to share savings with the federal government. So independent of the fact that the government had to pay these plans a share of those shared savings, um, still on net, there were this $70 million in savings. That's beautiful. And the other important factor is that all of these entities are held accountable for meeting quality targets. Mm -hmm. Things like uh, avoidance of unnecessary hospitalizations for patients who have multiple chronic conditions. All of those 53 DCEs met 100% of the quality requirements. Not one fell short. Wow. So I, I know you can't name all 53, and I don't mean to like, uh, you know, they're the ones that you may not name, but are you able to give an example of like who these folks are? Oh, sure. Uh, again, a couple of them were, our, a number of them were our members. Uh, I'll just mention a couple. Village MD uh, in its Houston market, uh, where uh, it has had a big D DCE direct contracting presence, they had the highest rate of net savings among all these 53 participants. Uh, and met, again, 100% of the quality targets. Another big success was Oak Street, another of our members. Uh, so what we have here is kind of proof of concept that if you uh, are an organization that has the capabilities to take on risk and manage risk, uh, you can succeed and produce better results for patients than a comparable group of patients who are in the traditional Medicare program. And you're doing this not in the context of Medicare Advantage, mind you, but basically providing the Medicare benefits that people have come to love and enjoy, plus some additional benefits that you can provide by virtue of this payment mechanism. And again, produce better results. Um, the, the, it is worth saying that to be a direct contracting entity, that is to take on risk, you've got to have the financial wherewithal to do that. And not many small practices can do that. What the advantage that some of these entities like Oak Street and like Village MD have is they have private investment behind them including in some instances private equity, but also other investment. Uh, for example, one of the big investors in uh, Village MD is Walgreens. Uh -huh. So if you've got a big backer behind you who can put up the money, you know, if you're going to take on risk, you're essentially operating more or less like an insurance company, right? Yeah. You're, yeah. you're saying if this person's care is, you know, twice what the capitated amount I'm getting to pay for them is I eat that. Yeah. <laughs> eat that right. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, and, uh, 
that has happened. Uh, the, one of the big DCE participants, Clover Health, actually lost money and lost money for the government. So um, this isn't uh, work for the faint of heart or for those who don't have pretty adequate financial backing. That's been controversial in some circles. There are uh, politicians who think that uh, absolutely no way should any private investor be behind uh, Medicare providers. The counter argument to that is, well, look at what we've got. We've got a primary care system in this country that has been systematically underinvested in for decades. Uh, and now we have the private investment community stepping up to the plate to create new structures of primary care and give organizations the capability to manage risk, to manage care, and seek the best outcomes for patients. What's wrong with that yeah. uh, uh, is really the question. And I think things like these first-year results of the direct contracting program show that there really is a lot of potential if you put the right recipe behind a committed group of providers you can get really successful results not just for patients but for american taxpayers as well yeah no this is this is really good so the question for you you have your spring uh, annual conference i used to call it your annual conference but it looks like you might have two big conferences every year um, so your spring conference is coming up in 2023. I'm guessing direct contracting will be discussed. I could be wrong. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the conference and maybe some of the themes coming up this spring? Absolutely. Our overarching theme is going the distance. Uh, and we mean that in several respects. First of all, all of our groups are trying to go the distance in the transition to value-based care. Uh, many of them have been, as I said earlier, in, um, in delegated risk relationships with payers in Medicare Advantage for years. Many of them are now uh, providing care within the context of Medicaid managed care. Many of them are in some of the alternative payment models that have been brought out at the federal level, whether uh, accountable care organizations, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, or uh, ACO REACH, which is what the uh, direct contracting program is being renamed as, as of uh, January 2023. Uh, they're in all of those different flavors of, of uh, alternative payment models. And uh, that requires a lot of skill, a lot of uh, adept activity and behavior on their part and restructuring, even down to restructuring workflow of patients and the practices. So they're going the distance to make that transition to value and to provision of value-based care. They're also going the distance now as uh, the whole system seeks to pull itself uh, back up together again as we seemingly emerge from the pandemic, although I say seemingly because even as even as we're recording this, as we know, there have been uh, up, uh, surges, small surges, I should say, of COVID-19, particularly in Southern California. But where everybody is imagining that this is going to be a tough season in terms of COVID, in terms of flu and RSV the and potentially other infectious diseases so we're not out of the woods by any stretch and our member groups are going the distance uh, beyond that as they essentially look for ways to uh, make sure that patients really understand the systems they're in trust them uh, they're going the distance amid various changes that could be potentially made in the Medicare Advantage program. So we thought overall that was a really good theme to use for our groups in this particular year. I should add, as we know, a number of groups have been under a lot of financial pressure, in part because of the pandemic and also wage increases uh, within the healthcare workforce. So it's not the easiest time for many of them. We really 100% confident everybody's going to get through it, but going the distance is really going to be what's required uh, to get through this period. Awesome. Awesome. So that's in May this year, or sorry, in 2023. Um, I've attended uh, the conference in San Diego many times. 
um, and uh, really enjoyed it. The speakers, I know you've been a speaker as well, um, interacting with folks I haven't seen from health plans, from the medical groups. Um, it's been great. So that's happening in May. Um, is the information yeah. up on the website, Susan, or is that are, are details still being worked out? Yes, we're, we're starting to get information out and we'll have our, well, the, the earliest registration links will be coming out very shortly in the new year. But yes, it's May 31st, June 1st and June 2nd. Those are the dates. And we'll be back at our traditional venue at the Marriott in San Diego, right on the harbor. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. Love that location. It's an excuse for me to get down there for work. Uh... Might try to take the family in the future. Um, very good. So you also have a fall conference that I wanted to touch on as well. Um, would you mind uh, sharing about that? Yes, uh, we we do have one. We just wrapped ours up at the end of October, beginning of November. A really successful conference. We called uh, the theme was transitions. Uh, again, numbers of transitions that our groups have been going through, moving out of the pandemic, moving into these various new. Uh, uh, value-based care models. We actually, as a group, as a, as APG, launched a couple of new coalitions at the colloquium, as we call it. Uh, our new ACO MSSP, that stands for Medicare Shared Savings Plan Coalition. Uh, those who follow this closely will know that CMS has proposed a number of changes in the Medicare Shared Savings Program that will be rolling out in 2023, including new features to reward plan, uh, uh, provider groups and others who take meaningful steps to reduce disparities in care and improve uh, equity and equitable outcomes for patients. So our MSSP coalition uh, had a session that focused on some of those changes that are coming forward in the program. We also had a meeting of our ACO REACH coalition. These are the entities that are very focused on that model that I just described, what was direct contracting, now morphing into ACO REACH, which also has a lot of provisions in it to encourage uh, reducing care disparities, improving equity, and really addressing the needs of individuals who live in, who have lived traditionally in medically underserved areas. So understanding exactly who's doing what as they file their equity plans for to the federal government and uh, undertake other efforts to achieve the various parameters in the program. We had a good information sharing session around that. We also launched a new Medicaid coalition because we have a number of groups who are seeing Medicaid patients, and in California in particular, where the program is Medi-Cal, lots and lots of Medi-Cal patients, and all of that is now has moved into a managed care environment, is moving into a managed care environment. And so understanding some of the issues that are involved, particularly the administration of the Medi-Cal program in California, is of great interest to many of our members. And we're supporting our members in other states with active Medicaid managed care as well. Well, uh, so we launched all of those coalitions. We had a series of breakout sessions focused, among other things, on workforce, on innovations in healthcare, like hospital at home programs and adva so-called advanced care at home programs, uh, and some really wonderful speakers. Uh, for example, Tom Insel, former head of the National Institute of Mental Health, who has come out with a book uh, on mental health care and every aspect of of mental health care that is so terribly broken in this country particularly for people with serious mental illness and uh, he gave us a wonderful set of his uh, his uh, prescriptions for how we can knit back together a functional mental health system that really puts patients uh, and those in need of mental health care first. Uh, and very, very importantly, we also had a wonderful presentation from Dr. Anthony Fauci, who of course is retiring at the end of this month after his many decades of government service uh, for about 40 of those leading the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, and also most recently serving as presidential health advisor to President Joe Biden. And Tony just gave us a wonderful overview of, uh, first of all, where we are, where we stand now in the COVID pandemic, 
uh, what uh, w- what we have all experienced and what providers in particular have experienced going through the pandemic, and then also looking back on the many battles that he has led and fought around uh, HIV AIDS, other uh, forms of infectious disease and, uh, and, and pandemics and epidemics that have plagued this country over the course of his long years of government service. So, uh, we were really proud because when our evaluations of that conference came in, uh, everybody to a person said they would recommend this conference to a friend or colleague. So in terms of uh, so- so-called net promoter scores, uh, we scored 100%. And we're really thrilled uh, that, uh, that, that people found the conference of as much value as they really did. Setting the bar really high uh, for the spring. That is great. And sounds like a great experience, Susan. So uh, folks, yeah, I encourage you to check it out. I've been to the uh, conference in San Diego many times, um, hoping to go again in 2023. Encourage you guys to check it out. Is the best place to stay up to tabs on what APG is doing via the website, Susan, or any recommendations there? Yes, our website, APG.org. All the key... uh, uh, issues that we're involved in are covered there. We, uh, you can go online and see our responses to various requests for information that we've uh, supplied to, back to the federal government. We just commented on a CMS proposal to create a national provider directory. Uh, we have a frequently asked questions document there about the a- ACO REACH model. Uh, lots of other uh, interesting and important material for our members as well as for the community at large. So definitely please do check out our website. Awesome, Susan. We'll really appreciate you being a guest. I know you have a very busy schedule and we're in the holiday period while recording. So appreciate you making the time. Quick shout out to Greg Phillips as well for helping to coordinate uh, this interview. And uh, Susan, thanks again for being on the show. Again, great to be with you, Gavin. Happy holidays. Thanks everyone for tuning in to another episode of Pop Health Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. And if you have and want to check out other episodes, visit us at pophealthpodcast.com, iTunes or Apple Music, Spotify, Stitcher, and now YouTube as well. Take care.